So good morning everyone. Um, this is a meeting to uh, discuss the Huron River Chain of Lakes project and uh, we have here uh, Dr. Doug Pullman. He's our lake manager uh, and we have Lisa Huberty from the Aquatic Nuisance Control from the MDEQ and Greg Peter and Dave Valutis from the uh, PBWOA uh, Lake Association and Theo Egremont. He is the Public Works uh, manager and myself, Jonathan Plukas, the environmental um, person involved with this project, so program coordinator. Uh, so welcome, thank you for coming here. Um, we're just going to talk about what's going on in 2018 on the HRCL project and what we can look forward to. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Coleman. Okay. Um, HRCL was, uh, that project was um, really fraught with a lot of unexpected uh, uh, issues uh, during the 2018. It was just not a, a normal lake management con uh, project. But before I get into some of those details, I think it's really important to emphasize what it is that we're doing. And um, um, if there, hopefully there's not that misconception that it's just a weed control program. We're really looking at an overall lake management program and one where we're looking at primarily the aquatic plant community, those, that, those plants that inhabit the bottom of the lake. But we're trying to make certain that what we do creates a sustainable condition that is good for recreation and good for the support of basic ecological functions. And experience has taught us that if we fail to do that, if we are just chasing after this weed or that weed, for example, there always will be another weed or that weed that we'll have to then address. It's much better to take a, a more of an ecological approach to the lake and look at what it is that we're really aiming at, and that is to create a more stable ecosystem. Um, and by that I mean create because it has been somewhat destabilized by exotic and invasive species that have shown up in the, in the entire system over the past several years. So as those have destabilized the ecosystem, we look at suppressing those so that we can create greater biological diversity and a more stable system, and one that would be perhaps better able to take the next onslaught of whatever invasive species lurk on the borders of Michigan, um, borders of the United States, and will ultimately uh, probably show up and be a challenge not only for the HRCL, but all lakes in the state. So with that focus, we're looking at creating a biologically diverse plant community. Um, that is what guides the decision making. That is what um, is what we approach the DEQ with when we want to apply for a permit to do something. And certainly even before the um, mechanical harvesting machines go out, we're thinking in ecological terms. What's the best thing for the labor? What's the best thing for the residents? Doesn't mean everyone's going to be happy. That's that's just part of a lake management program. But you know, generally speaking, if people understand where our primary concern is creating a stable lake environment, um, they they're satisfied with that. And the other thing that's good about that, if we posit that as is the our, our target, that's where we're headed. Generally speaking, recreational concerns are assuaged also because a lake that's stable, a lake that's got good biological diversity, generally is found to be satisfactory for lake users and recreation. So with that in mind, when we developed the project, um, uh, at the beginning of 2018, we were slogging our way through um, um, uh, the permitting process looking at applying aquatic herbicides to really suppress uh, a number of exotic and invasive species that created some real issues, not only ecologically, but real issues from this uh, perspective of recreation. And based on the, the two years of data we had before that, we uh, look at those sites. Early 2018, um, representatives from the PBWA, Jonathan went, and our contractors, and we do a, a look around the lake, if you will, because this system, just like every other system in, in southern Michigan, and that is every year presents us with a, a different set of circumstances and a, and a whole new group of challenges. Mm -hmm. So we can try to, which I'll t 
talk about later, where you try to look at a crystal ball and say, this is what's going to happen next year. As soon as you do that, usually something else happens. And so it's like we, trying to make a flu vaccine. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it kind of is. So you know, we, we look at the data that we have, but when it, when it comes to the actual implementation of the various aspects of the project, we really uh, set those um, expectations up in the spring. When we do that, I hope people understand that the, uh, and Lisa will address this also and what she has to do in terms of permitting. But say for example, our herbicide contractor now holds all of the herbicide application permits. They're in, in that company's name. And they're the ones, so when we speak to them and when I deal with them, uh, they're usually charged with not applying an aquatic herbicide. That's not what we do. We go out and we say, this has milfoil and we want that suppressed. And that's a big difference. Uh, then we look at what it is that they propose to do, what we've charged them with, and that is to alleviate a nuisance condition. And then he begins to make recommendations. And that's where, with the PBWA and Jonathan there, we all kind of hash out what our options are, what the expected outcomes would be of those treatments, or if it's even cutting what we expect, how long we expect it to last, um, you know, what the benefits would be long term. All those things are considered, and then we finally decide on what it is that is going to be done and implemented. We also give the applicator a little bit of um, latitude each spring. Uh, we're talking about plants that can grow at pretty frightening rates. Uh, starry stonewort and even some of the milfoil hybrids we have can go from virtually inconspicuous to uh, considerable nuisance conditions in 10 days to two weeks that time of year. So we might do a, a, a what we call our pre-season check, but the application of those materials may not happen for a week or two. And so typically, we hear, I hear all the time from applicators, you know, oh, oh we've got more over here. And um, you know, generally we know, oh yeah, that could, that could be, we've looked at it, and go ahead. Or, and this happened more often than, the, than that instance this past spring, uh, plant growth just didn't come on as we expected. So more of my calls were, you know, it didn't show up. Should we wait? And then we said, yeah, let's, let's wait on those. It works on uh, the HRCL because we've got a very good system of identifying areas around the lake, and they're called AROS. And those are aquatic resource observation sites. So when we communicate, we can do that really easily. So they'll say, you know, uh, for example, yesterday I was speaking with an applicator. We're doing an evaluation treatment out there. And I said, you know, when you head out to um, AROS 614, you're going to see a lot of this particular plan. So we were able to communicate really quite well, do it on the fly. We don't want to get ourselves into the situation where we survey the lake and then two weeks later it's treated and we miss a bunch of spots or things don't happen as we expect and we treat areas that didn't need to be treated. So we try to keep that kind of flexibility going because we want to do what's best for the lake. Not what's best for our schedules necessarily. We try to work with our schedules, but we at the same time try to be, um, you know, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, I suppose. Um, have that kind of fluidity in the, in the program. Uh, can I, can yeah. I just make one comment? Is that since this is a dynamic system, yeah. okay, the expectations are going to change, your yes. plans are going to change, so communication is essential. So people understand that this, it's a dynamic, you know, situation and that, you know, Therefore, expectations set in the spring are going to change throughout the year, mm -hmm. both from your standpoint, the applicator, of course, has just a mission to carry out, but what they do has to be permitted. So that's, that whole mechanism needs to be streamlined so that you, know, you don't have to sit there and wait for a permit. You know? um, and you got the AROS, right? Mm -hmm. Well, are those and inventory by species diversity within each area? Do we know what's in there? I mean, if you want to create a sustainable, you know, um, biodiverse, sustainable eco ecological system, you need to know what's there to begin with. Yes. So like, is it here on River Watershed Council or the Michigan Natural, in the, uh, Natural Features Inventory folks at Michigan State been, been, you know, involved in looking at the underlying, you know, um, 
biosystems that are there and where things are? That really goes beyond their capabilities. Okay. So we do it ourselves. Okay. And so, so what the, the charting has then taken place in populating the chart with, you know, what is there per a particular coordinate? Is that what? Right. Because we're not seeing that in the uh, in the website. Well, we have the lake surveys that Dr. Yeah. Pomo does, and so that's covered because he covers the whole biodiversity okay. of each area that he's yeah. looking at. So that's how he identifies areas of need, is looking at where the invasives are, where the nuisance plants are. So part is that of that lake is that the tiering, the, the color coding, in the the one mapping that I saw on the website. If you look at the tiers, that allows us. First of all, every AROS we collect not only what species are present, okay. we look at their density, how they're distributed within what we call the AROS, in other words, edge effect, because fishers people like okay. that. We look at that, we look at relative height in the water column. And then from those data, we're able to tell you what condition is your lake in. In other words, we don't emphasize a lot what species are where, but what's the condition of the overall lake? And the so, substrate? I mean, so is this a gravel bed or is it, you know? We actually did do that. Uh, that was completed last summer. Yeah. Uh, and it was done. There's another commercial product out there. We actually enhanced that. Those data, um, we just received uh, an analysis of what kind of substrates are down there. And those don't change a lot from right. year to year. Right. Right. So it's really the plant communities that are the focus of two surveys. Those plant ones. communities reflect the substrate. Uh, sometimes. I mean, you know, there's yeah. the geology. And, and energy. energy. Yeah, geology and energy yeah. are the two things. Energy is the other thing. Yeah. Some of those shallow areas you get yeah. out of. And so, even though the soils might be, you'd think, habitable. you got wake boats disturbing. Yeah. Right. yeah. And that's probably a, a greater influence than, than <coughs> ever before. Yeah. Well, to stress yeah. that most of this information is contained within the lake surveys, yes. that is on our website. Yeah. So, it's we have right. that stuff posted on the website. Yeah, okay, because I, I, I was kind of, well, I was confused navigating through that, trying to identify what is what and so on. But um, if I could just take a minute just to kind of tie in the collective group right here, if we really can look at this as kind of a, a we're here for the same common goal, and it's a management kind of a session, if you will, with a common goal, and it, we all have kind of key components here. and. In looking at what our role, if you want to call it a role, with the PBWA is is trying to educate our folks, be a conduit of information to them, which means data, so that we can understand and interpret and, and so on. Um, so you know, to kind of recap, this is a five-year program. Year one was really a late start, and uh, so they're really in 2016 really wasn't a, or 17 wasn't a whole lot done, and as a result. You know, you folks cut the uh, the townships cut the tax, you know, take on that because of the late start. So, and then 2018 was kind of like getting ramped up, and then the the thing with the snuff box came into play, which we all understand. It's kind of the new things come up. We get that. So, I guess you know what I'm saying, and kind of taking the approach of we have a community out there from the township supervisors to the folks that you've been fielding questions you have, we have, and so on, we have to collectively as a group figure out the communication link and understand where things are going and timing is, is really important a lot of this and that's why this is wonderful that we're having this meeting. Back in the summer I did talk to Jeff Knox and he mentioned about um, uh, you know the permitting process will kind of like start in January, February uh, as I understood for the next year. Is that somewhat true? No, let me, let me just chime in a little bit okay. there. Um, so we've been talking with uh, Doug and with Jeff about the upcoming permitting season um, and have set it up so that um, our permitting season begins in November. Okay. Our, our new application for the next season will be available in November. Um, and as soon as Doug and Jeff are ready, um, an application can be submitted online. Um, Jeff has already submitted his treatment reports from 2018, so we have those records um, in ahead of deadline. The normal deadline for those treatment reports is November 30th um, of this year. Those reports are already in. 
so that we can analyze the previous uh, treatment activity um, and relate that to the proposed treatments that are coming in for 2019. Um, those can come in as early as November or December when, um, when Jeff and Doug are ready. Um, in addition to that, we have um, an established um, uh, routine and outcome of the previous review. So we uh, went through the review for protected species last year. Um, we'll be going through that again, but um, the issues were already dealt with. They may change a little bit if we get new information, but the basic um, approach and roadmap uh, was established and carried out in 2018, so presumably in 2019 uh, that should go more um, smoothly um, and decisions made uh, more quickly. That's not to say that, um, you know, the decision will be the same as um, uh, because new information may, may impact the decision. Um, in addition to that, we uh, dealt with uh, public health questions uh, with Ann Arbor drinking water. We had to establish um, a condition for notifying Ann Arbor drinking water. That has already uh, taken place. We're reevaluating that. Uh, condition. So essentially we are prepared with previous experience to carry forward for 2019 with some possible changes. So uh, the infrastructure is there. Yeah. You get really, the overall, really the overall structure is okay. there. We have the decision makers already laid out and kind of so, and you'll just plug in whatever new information you have and see if it affects the ultimate decision. Exactly. So, so it should happen um, faster. you know, when Doug and Jeff come in with their proposed treatment map for 2019, um, we will have already gone through the um, the challenges of analyzing the location of protected mussels in that given water body, analyzing which products are being proposed for use in that water body, uh, calculating you know any kind of dilution of that product and impacts uh, of uh, the active ingredient off the treatment site. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know some of those approaches and. Um, methods of analysis were already established, and so we'll be picking up with those again and refining them. For example, we will probably receive new um, uh, uh, water body volume estimates because uh, so, so Kaiser, I was going to ask the hydrodynamics of the, yeah. the flow system been investigated enough? That We've already we did that in 2018, okay. so we have the flow estimates, for example. Um, We'll be probably using new water volumes to do calculations. So essentially, similar analysis, um, but with possibly new information, depending on. Is that a dynamic system, though, so that you can tell if the, the spring is going to be a different flow rate than the summer is going to be a different yes. flow rate? Than the yes. The flow estimates that we receive um, are monthly estimates. Okay. These are modeled. Um, modeled estimates. Um, so you and get flow rate and height of river levels and stuff up, upstream, so you kind of anticipate what the volume of the flow through. Exactly. Is. So we can do some estimating of risk to movement of product, um, you know, out of the water body if that's an issue. Uh, so a lot of that analysis is already in place, and probably uh, it will be just a matter of checking it with existing information um, and in the meantime we have also received a review document about uh, the toxicological effects of our active ingredients on um, mussels and host fish species so that document um,